agreements with as many countries as he could. Uh, so these were negotiated with countries all over the world in all the continents uh, in which the, well, the United States and Sweden or the United States and Chile or the United States and Thailand would uh, consider their relative strengths and weaknesses and come up with something that was supposed to address, uh, would address the needs of the two economies and um, uh, you know, uh, eliminate trade in areas where they were producing the same thing but augment trade in areas where the countries were producing had different productive capacities. This was very successful in terms of re-stimulating foreign trade and became the basis for post, uh, one of the foundations for post-war uh, trade policy. Uh, at the same time, instead of raising tariffs, FDR sought to punish dumping. Uh, which is another form of unfair competition practices, particularly where foreign governments were subsidizing the production of goods that were then being sold in the United States. As it turned out, the primary dumper, the primary un uh, unfair subsidizer was Nazi Germany. So much of U.S. Uh, penalties, uh, 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 trade penalties in the 1930s well before we got into even close to war was directed at Nazi Germany as the primary uh, uh, violator of what the United States thought was fair trade practices. Um, and the United States also did something that the British and the French and the Dutch were not willing to do, which was to increase uh, capital investment in industrialize, uh, that would industrialize other countries particularly country like Mexico and Brazil and, uh, and Chile and in Latin America, uh, or Canada and Australia, uh, to break down the idea uh, that the British had maintained for many years of a global division of labor. Now, in effect, the US, division of US was simply rethinking the global division of labor because if Brazil is going to start making steel and automobiles, uh, the place where it was initially going to buy all the machinery it needed to industrialize was going to be from the United States. So the United States would become, rather than the producer of automobiles, uh, it would become the, the primary producer of machines to make automobiles. So and presumably you make more money this way. Uh, so... Uh, one of the major things of the New Deal that I think is, uh, is not so much the programs itself, which had a mixed history and were often very confused and certainly were um, implemented in, in ways that um, were oftentimes unjust even and even contradictory. Um, so that... Uh, but the main aspect of the New Deal was a redefinition of who was included in the core American nation. And this was something that, the, uh, that really uh, hammered the Republicans, who had a view of the nation as being centered in white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, in old stock Americans whose values represented what was unique about the United States. For the Democrats, the nation was the working people, working men and women of all ethnicities, and when the Democrats were willing to say it, of all races. This is something that I think is really what's running through Bulosan's book, is that he embraces this Roosevelt, he embraced that Rooseveltian or New Deal idea of the American nation being built on a common ground in which people from all over the world uh, are equally contributing to the building of the country. And that, uh, that uh, Bulosan can see the discrimination which he has personally suffered as uh, something in the past that's going to recede, or he believed would recede because the New Deal was mobilizing the American people to unite rather than to divide. 
Uh, now, the process was more complex than that. But it was this, in this inclusive sense of participation that was fundamental to the New Deal uh, coalition and that won over African-American voters in the North and the West. African-Americans had been voting 95% plus for Republicans and for good reason. But seeing this new vision of, Amer of an inclusive America, uh, it made sense to switch over to the Democrats, even though the Democrats remain the party of Jim Crow in the South. So, but people had faith that these contradictions were temporary, that they could be worked out over time, and that the country would be united in the sense of, of serving uh, the poorest, bringing, continually bringing the poorest into a participation. And so even if the New Deal was uh, contradictory in many respects, uh, the ideas that it promoted uh, seemed to be, uh, that were inspiring to people and seemed to say, yes, you can be part of this country too. Yes, you can be part of the government. You can enter politics. Yes, you can uh, enter into the economy. You can earn a decent wage. The Republicans couldn't figure out how to deal with this. They remained a party of white Anglo-Saxon Protestants until the, uh, essentially the end of the 1960s, when Richard Nixon figured out uh, the Southern strategy as a way of speaking not only to Southern Democrats, but also to Catholic and Jewish uh, urban uh, uh, ethnic groups. Uh, and in that case, then reinscribing the Republican Party as the party of whiteness, not just uh, no longer of uh, uh, old American stock. The working person and his ability to do miraculous things was to be uh, the heart of the New Deal vision of, the, of America. Now, in effect, uh, well, it's a culture, uh, a political culture that's celebrating the working person, people wanted to go to school, improve their skills, and become professionals of some sort. But there's a way, uh, there's this celebration of uh, uh, working class manliness that was important for understanding the New Deal. Uh, this is one of the many dam projects that the federal government used to mobilize unemployed people and put them to work doing manly things, sometimes women doing manly things, to build uh, you know, infrastructure that the country needed or thought it needed, and that this was not charity, that people, uh, this was something that uh, was just part of... Uh, being uh, should be part of citizenship, and the people who benefited from the New Deal should not have to say thank you to anybody, that uh, they were at the core of the country. And then uh, this is also then moving into the labor movement and mobilizing the labor movement uh, to uh, become more aggressive with government assistance and generally the assistance of lots of people in the country. Um, there were, uh, it was a period of increased unionization, and by the end of the 30s, a third of the country belonged to trade unions. So the, the New Deal was a period of rapid unionization. In the North, the industrial Midwest and the Far West, not in the South, not in the Great Plains. One of the most dramatic strikes was uh, against GM when, the, war, when the, the company refused to negotiate with the United Auto Workers and it shut uh, down the plants rather than recognize the union. So the uh, workers broke into the plants and occupied them. And then the local and state government refused to evict them. The uh, GM sent in its private uh, militias 
uh, who were fought off, and a stalemate essentially developed, which forced GM to, uh, to negotiate an agreement. Agricultural workers also uh, were mobilizing. The agricultural workers were the, the most poorly paid uh, part of the uh, workforce. The National Labor Relations Act excluded our uh, agricultural workers from its protections. This was done because Southern congressmen would not tolerate anything that would give uh, uh, African American workers in the South anything, any legal rights. But that did not prevent agricultural workers from organizing in the North and the Far West. And this kind of tough militancy then becomes an important part of a math, working class pride and a sense of inclusion became an important part of mobilization for the war, part of the spirit of the country uh, being able to face uh, foreign adversity um, you know, because it was a country of people who pushed back when, when they got pushed. Now, 19, now, by the end of the 1930s, the economy has stabilized. Unemployment is about 12%, uh, which means that there's still pockets of poverty, but by and large, production is, uh, has returned to uh, steady norms, incomes have increased, and we have the first uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics that give us an accurate view of uh, incomes and expenditures for different kinds of American families. So I'm, I'm giving you the figures for the median, a family of four earning the median income, which at that time was $2,240 a year. Now to, today it's th the median income uh, uh, for a family of four is, I think, $38,000 a year. So you can multiply all the figures by uh, however many times 2240 goes into 38,000 to come up with uh, corresponding figures in uh, contemporary terms. But uh, at this time, already slightly half of the population is now homeowners, and you have people spending approximately a little over 10% of their income on housing, either mortgage or rent. Now, I'm sure none of you spend 10% of uh, your income on housing, and, no, and since the 1970s, the tip, uh, it's been about a third of our income. Uh, but at this point, 10% uh, was considered a fair, 10% uh, of your income was considered a fair and reasonable uh, cost for your housing. Now you would have a simple home for a family of four. There would be a kitchen, a dining room, and a living room, and two bedrooms, one bath. Um, food would be the largest uh, item on your uh, uh, on your expenditures, uh, but the second largest would be assistance to parents, which tells us that Social Security and whatever